Okay, page number 56, when we all get to heaven. Boy, heaven will change then, won't it? <laughs> It'll be a different place. Oh, 
don't die, we want you to go do something, yeah. right? Well, if you will, turn to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter number three. Mm -hmm. Now, in chapter number three, I want to let you read it all yourself eventually. Uh, and, and I hope that you will. But there's a lot of names there. Mm -hmm. If you're looking to name your child something uh, and give them a biblical name, there's a lot of names in here uh, that you could give your children. Uh, so that, that's a good place. But I will not attempt to read all these names out. But what we're looking at is as Nehemiah is there to build the walls, and of course we understand as we already went through, that God had spoken and burdened his heart about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And in that, God had called him. He was the cupbearer. He went to the king. He got permission from the king to go down there and rebuild the walls. He took two months traveling, went down there, he then waited three days to tell anybody what he was doing. On the third day, that evening, he went out and he surveyed the walls. He surveyed everything, and he got on his, his horse and rode around, and even in some places, he couldn't even ride his horse because there was so much debris in the way. And so then he got done. The next day, he met with a group of men to get them on board with what he was doing and told them what God had laid on his heart. And they said, well, let us build the wall. And so now, verse chapter number three here, we see the planning that is there for success. And we see the people who are going to get involved in this. Uh, you ever saw the, the TV show Extreme Makeover? Uh, remember it used to be on where they would find some family maybe that was distraught or some family that had gone through a, a lot of problems and they would then send that family off on a vacation and during that they would come in and rebuild that house and make it this massive beautiful place and then they would have the bus in front bring the people up and they'll say bus driver move that bus and then the bus would go by and then here would be this house that is just great, look totally different. Uh, that's sort of what Nehemiah is about to do. Mm -hmm. he, he's about to do an extreme makeover on this wall. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's been 401 years that people have been there, supposedly, to do this work. But the problem is this, they haven't done it. And he comes in and once he starts it, he rebuilds this wall in 52 days. And some of the wall is still in place that he rebuilt. Um, there, there, if you, you go through and you see all kinds of different places here, as you read down through here, you see the fish gate. Well, first you, you see the sheep gate. What was the sheep gate? Well, the sheep gate, that was really where the sheep came in. Now, do you understand that the sheep gate is still being used today as a sheep gate? Even today. And this was where the priest would bring the sheep in. And this is where they would inspect the sheep for the sacrifices and all. Um, and, and so the, the, that gate's still there. And then you, you, you look verse number three, you got the fish gate. And then you go on down through here and you start seeing some of these other people. Verse number 13, you see the valley gate is repaired. Um, verse 14, you see the dung gate. That was a smelly gate. Mm -hmm. And seeing that one is repaired. And then you, you keep on going and you look looking down through here and you see some of these other gates. And I'm trying to find this one where a lot of y'all would go in at. Um, it's called the old gate. Uh, that's where all the old people go in at. Uh, uh, <laughs> or, or, or the broad gate. That's where all the broad women. I mean, uh, the women. No, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. But uh, that is just, there, there's different gates, of course, throughout here. And you see where they're, uh, you got the fountain gate. 
and the different gates. And each gate has a specific name and a specific thing that happens there. Now, as the rebuilding work in this passage is a reminder that no matter what falls apart, no matter what falls apart in your life, God can rebuild it. And sometimes in less time than it took to get it messed up. In other words, one of the things we can see through this passage, as you read through it, and we'll read a few places here and there throughout, and most people would just skip through this passage and not look at it all together. Most preachers would. They'd be like, oh, that's just a bunch of names, and who did this over in the gate, and who did this on this gate, and who did this on this part? And, and most people would skip through that but one of the things I believe we need to do is to preach the whole counsel of God. Mm -hmm. God has it in here for a reason. And there's a reason God wants us to see this. Now, one of the things you'll notice about this, this chapter, there's one person that's not mentioned in the whole passage. Nehemiah. I wonder why is that? Maybe that's because the rebuilding of this wall was not about Nehemiah. It was about the people who got involved and decided to fill the gaps in the wall that were needed. And this is why God is saying, I do my work not necessarily through preachers or through people, through individuals. I do my work through the people in the land. And that's what I believe God's trying to get across here. And, and as we look through this, we want to preach the whole counsel of God. I remember one time hearing Dr. Oliver B. Green and somebody was interviewing him. And they asked him, so Dr. Green, we, we understand that you know you have always preached through the Bible and, and, and through the whole scripture. Why is it that most preachers do not preach through the Bible like that? And you would think, okay, this is Oliver B. Green. He's going to give some big statement about why preachers don't do that. And his statement was, well, that's because I lazy. It's because I lazy. And that's about the way he would say it, too. And, and so a lot of people are lazy. And to be honest, I thought about just skipping this chapter. And I said, I remember Dr. Oliver B. Green saying that. I better not skip this chapter. Let's preach through this chapter. And, and see what is it that God has for us. And one of the things that we can see is be, even though something's been broken down, it can be rebuilt. There is hope for a broken down life. There is hope for a broken down family. There is hope for a broken down church, a broken down community. And when God gets a person with a good plan going forward, God can do his agenda in whatever it is that he wants to do. And I believe God can do that. I, I don't know what God's going to do here, but I believe God can do it. Okay? Uh, it's, it's not us. It's him. And, and more than likely, sometimes we are planning and putting the foundation in place for something greater to come out of it in the, uh, on down the road. And, and most times that's the way God uses it. Now, these people who had lived in Jerusalem for these years, they had just never linked up to deal with the wall issue. They just never linked up to deal with it. They'd never really gotten unified. And it took this man by the name of Nehemiah who came in and he unified them around a purpose and suddenly things were getting done. And the devil's task is to keep people in the church from linking up towards a common purpose or goal. Because if he can keep the people in the church from linking towards a common purpose or goal, then he'll get some going this way, some going that way, some going that way, some going that way, some going over there, and some going over there, and nothing will ever get accomplished. 
And so the devil's task is to sometimes, I think, keep a church busy. And if he can keep that church busy enough and keep everybody going their own different directions, then they never really have a central purpose or goal of what they're supposed to do. And so therefore, they never reach it. And everybody is only going about their own purpose and their own goals and their own issues of life. And, and as long as he can keep you disunified, he can keep walls torn down and he can keep gates burned. And we've got enough walls that have been torn down in our churches and we've got enough gates that are burned so that nobody wants to come through the gates of our church because they've been burned. And so when Christians realize that they have a common enemy and all other problems and issues are insignificant and they find themselves in a purpose there is that power that is in unity that they have and sometimes it's finding that purpose and finding that that goal of what we want to accomplish what is it we want to do what is it we we need to do here and and so that is a principle that has got to be applied in almost area every area of our life in our homes a, a husband will say well my wife is different from me and thank God she is I met some of you husbands uh, and of course she she is and and if both marriage partners were the same one of them be unnecessary you don't need two people who are the same do you uh, you, you want some people that are different and the main thing a husband has to do in the home is to set God's agenda for his family that's the husband's main job in the home is setting God's agenda now the problem is we got too many ladies who are setting God's agenda for the family because the husband is not. And that is really the husband's responsibility. That is his job. And if, if he doesn't do that, then everybody's got their own agenda. And you wonder why the kids go this way and the wife goes this way and the husband goes this way. It's because the husband failed to do his job in setting the agenda and getting it going in a place. And again, as I said, there is power in unity. And when a husband and wife has the same agenda for their kids and the same agenda for their home, and they are both empowered towards that agenda, then there is unity in that. And in that unity is the power to hold to that agenda. Does that make sense? And that's what we're missing. And, and unity is not sameness. Most people think unity is sameness. Unity is oneness of purpose and not necessarily sameness. And so we have the oneness of purpose. And in that fact, when people come to the place that... Uh, they have a purpose, and one of the problems we have in our country is they have all these meetings over race problems, and they don't seem to ever get anything accomplished. They don't ever seem that it goes anywhere. But part of that reason is because everyone has their own interests and agendas involved in those. And the only way we'll ever overcome that is when we have the same purpose. Is when we have something that is bigger than we are and we begin to focus all of the march and all the power and all the goals towards that purpose and we find common ground, only then will something be accomplished? And I think that's what Nehemiah did here. Because as you look here, I, I don't want you to miss the very first part here, because right here, verse number one, it says, then Elias, the 
high priest rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they builded the sheep gate. Mm -hmm. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it. Even when the tower of men, had, they sanctified it unto the tower of, I think it's Hanel. That's why I'm not going to read all these because I'll, I'll crucify every bit of these words here. But this Elijah, uh, if I even got that right, but we're, that's what we're going to call him. Uh, this is the high priest. Now, he's put his hand to the work. You know, he could easily say, hey, I'm, I'm the high priest. No, this is really not my job uh, to get out here in the dirt and get out here moving rocks and and, and moving all these kind of stuff. And, you know, um, my job's to pray and, and, you know, to be the leader. But this high priest said, hey, I'm not too good to get out here and work. I'm not too good to get out here and get dirty. And so he got out there and he got involved in that work. And that's the way it has to be. And the thing is, this high priest is the grandson of, I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, he is the grandson of Joshua, who was a high priest in there with um, Zerubbabel. Or maybe it, he's the grandson of Zerubbabel, I think it is. It, he's one of those, but he's very closely associated with the Zerubbabel in the sense he had come there, and then this is a guy who is now the high priest there. And so I don't want you to miss that this high priest and his fellow priests were leading the way to rebuild the walls of the community and to rebuild, be, rebuild the sheep gate. Now, what they did is they said, okay, we'll, we'll take care of this section. This will be ours. You see, what would come through the sheep gate? The sheep that would bought be sacrificed. Mm -hmm. So that this was a place that was a concern to them. Now, what's going to happen when you get somebody who has a concern of rebuilding this wall? They take ownership in it. And when they take ownership in it, guess what they're going to do? They're going to be more concerned that it's done right that it looks good, that it is just the way it's supposed to be. The problem with a lot of our churches today, and the reason they're not being built by you, is people are not taking ownership. Mm -hmm. and, and until we take ownership in the ministry that God's given us, then we'll never understand or have the burden and desire to make it what it should be. Is when we take the ownership in it. And so thus they were dedicated to the sheep gate, which was an action that foreshadowed their divine purpose and perspective and call. And, and that's where we have to do this. The mention of these men here brings me to another important part that is if a church, one of the first things we began to see that he begins to talk about being built was the sheep gate. And part of that was something that was going to service the church. And one of the greatest things is this, is any time a community needs to be rebuilt, it's going to start with this church. Our community here in Cartersville is struggling right now. We put in a little sex shop downtown. And then... They're talking about putting in a little strip joint. And I know we've just built a big, huge liquor store over here. And on New Harley Road, right down from my house, not even two blocks from my house, they're fixing to build another big, huge liquor store. But I ain't seen any new churches going up. I ain't seen any new churches being built or... Any of the other churches that are extending their walls out to get more people in. And so somewhere in our community here at Cartersville, we got a problem. And the problem always is when we're building everything other than the church. 
the values that must be operate in an area in order for that area to survive and for businesses to stay within themselves has to be set forth by a moral agent. And the greatest moral agent that our society has today is not the government. It's not business. It's not our schools for sure. But it's our church. And the better agency that there is to do that work is the church. Society needs a measuring rod. And if you don't have the proper measuring rod, how can you measure society? And the greatest measuring rod is the church in our society. But the problem is this, the church has gotten rid of its absolutes. The church has lost its standards and it has lost its rights on standing for what is right and what is wrong. Right here in the Word of God. And a lot of the churches today have gotten into the place of building social clubs more than the Word of God. And it's standing for what is right and standing for the truth that is in the Word of God. And the church should always point to the truth. I don't know if it's true. I watched a video of somebody that says it's true. Somebody told me it's true. But there's a huge church in our community of Georgia that, and I'm not going to mention it because I don't know if it's true or not, but it's one of the largest churches in America, they say. And he's about to have a big seminar and thing on the family and the home and, and, and celebrating the home. And that in this celebration and everything he's got, he's got one home that he's going to emphasize and show where there's two male partners who are in charge of the home. And if that is true, I feel sorry for the man because he's surely got away from what his daddy taught him. The church bases itself on the word of God. And when it does that, it can begin to turn a dilapidated community around into a place that could operate biblically on a good moral footing and grounding. And that's what we need today. And we, we, we need to have that. We've got to have that. And, and that's why I think we see here when he begins to build here, the first thing he begins to build is a place that is going to benefit the church. And that portion of the wall is what we see first. And I think that's appropriate. And, and I think that's wonderful. And you see that in um, verse number one. In verse number two, you see, and next unto him builded the men of Jericho. Now, the men of Jericho were commuters. They didn't live in Jerusalem. They, they lived outside of Jerusalem. Um, Meaning, there's a place in a local church family for people who must communicate a long distance to attend. I don't think that's always the wisest thing. Rick commutes a good little distance to attend church here. Uh, and we've had some in the past who commuted even farther than that to attend church here. And, matter of fact, I ran them all off, told them they needed to find a church in their local area. Then you won't find many pastors who do that. Why not running Rick off? Rick's, Rick's staying. He's, uh, he's part of the he's part of the the, the pillars of the church here. Uh, he stays, so we don't run him off. People tend to move away from communities where 
the spiritual needs are great. And sometimes what we need is maybe some of those people living in that community, maybe commuting to a good church, and then trying to win some of those people over so that that good church can then go to that community and help establish the moral agenda and a place that needs to be there in that community. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I think one of the problems that we did was when we pulled out of the public schools to start Christian schools. I'm thankful for Christian schools. I've taught in them. I started one. My son's gone to one, and so do I. But sometimes I wonder if we pulled our kids out of that, if maybe we should have got in there and got on the boards and took a stand and said, no, we're not going to stand for this to be taught to our kids. No, we're not going to stand for this. And we took our stand, but what we did is we handed that over to the liberal crowd who has now corrupted our kids in so many ways. And it's so big now, you wonder if you could ever turn it around. But I think you could. It's like eating an elephant. If you look at an elephant as the whole thing and you got to eat the whole thing at one setting, yeah, you'll never eat it. But if you think of, well, I can eat this ear this week and <laughs> eat that ear next week and we'll eat the trunk next week and uh, you, eventually you can have the whole elephant and eat the whole thing. And then sometimes we see things as these big elephants that we can't tackle, but we can't. And, and that's why I'm when I look at the sale of our property and rebuilding and all, I, I can't look at it <laughs> as the whole thing. We gotta say, okay, well, first step, we, we, we sell, second step, we, we're gonna do this, and then we're gonna do this, and God will open up the doors as we go there. Because if I look at this thing as a whole, I'm gonna get stressed. I, I, I'm gonna get stressed. But the thing is, is we, we need to come to the place and we need to see that while it's okay to commute to a church, we must also make sure that we let our godly presence be where it is that we live and that we are representing God in everything there. Look at verse number three through eight. In verse three through eight, we, we see that the, the, uh, the ghostsmiths and the perfumers made repairs. And these were people that normally would not get their hands dirty. I mean, these were the people who, you know, they worked with gold and melting the gold and making jewelry and stuff. And these people were the ones who made the, the perfume. They don't want to get there, get sweaty and start stinking. That wouldn't be good for business, would it? Hey, I got this perfume I want to give to you. Ooh, you smell bad. <laughs> well, I've been out here working on the wall. You know, it doesn't sound it doesn't sound like it goes along with their business, does it? Not a great business model. But these men may not have been used to do much physical labor, but they were willing to use their time and energy. And they wanted to be a part of the community. They wanted to be a part of that. There's gonna be people sometimes that can do a little in the church, but they might not do a lot. I remember when I was at Central Baptist and uh, I was cleaning out some closets one time and I found like boxes and boxes of these cups that said Central Baptist Church on Hattiesburg. And so I went to the pastor and I said, well, we got tons of these cups. He said, I don't know what to do with them. I said, can I, can I have them to do something with? He said, yeah, what, what are you thinking? I said, I don't know yet but I'll figure out something. So I got thinking about it and I went and got some candy bars and some candy and some little things and some tracks and some stuff about our church and I put them inside there and then I wrapped it in some cellophane and put a little ribbon around it and I went and showed the pastor and I said, here's what my thinking is. Every visitor comes to our church gets one of these cups. Oh, that's a great idea, Kim. I said, one of the problems we're having is people not filling out visitor's cards. So what we do is we pass out the visitor's card, they fill this out, and then on their way out, they go to our back console back there, and we have a lady back there who had these cups, and we show them this beautiful cup, 
and you fill that this out, and when you get go to leave, make sure you hand that card to them, and they will give you one of these beautiful cups just for you. And you know what we found out? We started getting business cards. And a lot of times you get a business card, and all you get is their name, Hattiesburg. Well, you can't go visit them. Well, when they were bringing that card there, we had those people there who were set to look to make sure we was getting all the information we needed. And so then we were able to then go visit those people, and that helped us. Well, what I needed was to get those cups. I didn't have time to really do those cups. But I found a lady who said she would come make the cups for me. So about every two weeks, she came to the church, and I would have all the supplies there, and she would make up cups for me so that we would have them ready and prepared. Because they won't do them too far ahead, and then the candy bars be stale. I mean, so we wanted it fresh, and we wanted it that way. And But I found something she could do. Something that this lady, who was elderly, probably couldn't go out and go visiting, do a bunch, but she could come in every two weeks and put some candy bars in a cup and wrap them up. And she did so much better than I did. Mm -hmm. It looked so much better than what I did. And she she said, well, we need some uh, we need some little tissue paper and stuff too. Oh, okay. And so she put it. I mean, it was really a nice little gift we gave out. And uh, people enjoyed them. People would tell us, oh, yeah, boy, we really enjoy our cup and uh, you know, and, and everything that you gave us. And and so that was something she could do. And sometimes, like I said, there's folks in the Bible that the Bible talks about 30 folks, 20 fold, and 64 fold, and 100 fold. There's some folks that can stuff a cup with candy bars and wrap it, but they'll never be able to teach a Sunday school class. But there's a place that they can serve. There's a there's something they can do. And that's what we find here. But then there's always those that don't want to do anything. And you you see that here where it says that, um, let me see, where is it at? Five. Verse number five, and it says, uh, and their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so there were some folks there that they just decided they didn't want to work. They didn't want to do anything. They, they were too good, and they didn't want to put their necks to the work. And so, though these men may not, again, been able to do a lot of physical labor, there was a place for them. And, and, and similar, you'll see in a community, the same agenda, you'll find people who are very busy in their time, and they don't have the energy to do things, but there's always something they can do. They can make a phone call. And Nehemiah sort of called out these wealthy people, who chose to be lazy and didn't want to lift their fingers, he did call them out there, though. That's one of the only ones you do see that he calls out. Then in verse 9 through 11, you see another uh, thing going on. And don't miss the rulers of half the district of Jerusalem who made repairs. Verse number 9. It said, And next unto them repaired this person, the son of her, and the ruler of half the part of Jerusalem. So this was one of the rulers. He decided, hey, I'm going to get involved. Some people have the idea, especially if they're considered to be somebody in the community, that the church is blessed to have me in it. Oh, the church is so blessed to have me in this community. And so let's get it straight. You're privileged that we allow you to come to this church in this community. Uh, and God allows you. And that by God's grace, this church is here to help you. And, and it is not because of who you are, but because of the cross of Christ and his grace that any of us are able to come into this church and to do these things. And then verse number 12, we see... And next unto him repair, and it's a Shalim, the, the son and the rulers of the half part of Jerusalem, he and his daughters. So he got his daughters involved. Even the, the ladies, you know what? God, God calls ladies to help in the work. 
But I'll tell you, God doesn't call women to preach. <laughs> now, I'm okay with women speakers that, that can speak to other ladies and that can do those kind of things. I'm okay with that. And I'm okay with women writers who write good books and, and things like that. But I am not with women preachers. I don't call women preachers. And I got an argument with somebody over that this week. And uh, But that that is not there. It's hard for a woman to be the husband of one wife. And, and so there's a lot of reasons for that. And the Bible says that a woman should not serve authority over a man. And so if a woman had to be a preacher, she would violate that law of God. So people say, well, what about Deborah? Well, Deborah was a prophetess, but she wasn't a preacher. Mm -hmm. That's a totally different calling, a totally different place. And so, but God does use women in great ways. And, and I don't think y'all ever ignore the work that women do in the church. Mm -hmm. Most of our churches not be where they are if it weren't for the ladies. Mm -hmm. And, and, and all in our churches. Then we see verse number 13 through 27. And apparently there was bachelors on the wall because Benjamin and Hashub had repairs opposite their house. Look at verse 23. In verse number 23, it says, And after him repaired Benjamin and Hashub over against their house, after him repaired um, these other people. So uh, these two these two guys were bachelors who were living in the same house, and they were working on the wall right outside their house. In other words, they're going to want to do it good, and the key here is that they were working on their house even though they were single, they found a place on the wall. They like, well, we're, we're, we're not really a family and we're not really this, but here were some two single guys and they found a place on the wall. And the good thing about it is if you go back to verse number 12, you see that those two guys might have run into the daughters of this other like of this other guy. <laughs> so sometimes when you're there on the wall and you're single, there might be a lady that's happening on the wall. So there's always a good thing there to do. But you know, you notice these kind of things as you read these passages, and that's why I think it's always important to not skip through this. What is it that God's going to show us here? What is it that God is seeing here? And it's and what it is, it's like a puzzle. And the, the, the whole passage is full of these little phrases like after them and next to them. And that is showing how the people combine their forces and begin to do the work together. And it's like a puzzle where you've got one that is the, the protus, protition, protitious or something like that, and the other one is the indentions. You've got the one that proceeds out and the one that's indented and then you find it and you place them together and the one that sticks out is easily bent until it is connected with the one that it fits into and then it's held solid and will not be bent so easy. And so when you see this, you begin to see how that this brought them together and it bound them together and it began to reinforce their unity and therefore their power, and therefore their ability to do the work that needed to be done. And, and so when you begin to see these things, and you begin to see this happening, this massive project that the people in Jerusalem for 150 years have been saying needed to be done, but as they looked at it, they said, it's just too big. And they looked at it, and they said, we can't do it. But one man came in and said, you know what? We can break it down into small places. And, you know, priests, y'all like sheep? You sacrifice them? What do y'all think about maybe building the, the sheep gate? And, you know, you guys over here, y'all 
like this. What, why don't y'all build this wall outside your house? You know, that's all you out here working on your house. Boy, your house looks nice. But man, anything could come across this wall and just come in there and just destroy your house. Wouldn't it be great if you built this wall across your house and this would be a wonderful thing for you. And those guys, two single guys said, you know what? That's a good idea. I think I'll do that. And so they got over there and they started doing the work. And sometimes that's what it takes. It's just somebody saying, why don't you help us with the work? And taking on the whole world is too big. So you got to focus on one thing at a time. I remember the little song, inch by inch is a cinch. And, you know, um, step by step. And what what's up? One of the, one of the I think it's um, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And one of my favorite scenes in the whole little Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is the snowman. And he's walking across there. And he starts singing that little song. Just put one foot in front of the other. And soon you'll be walking out the door. Just put, y'all remember that? In the little Rudolph? Oh, okay. well, y'all need to watch Rudolph again. <laughs> and that's one of my favorite scenes. And I love that little song and him singing, just put one foot in front of the other. And sometimes what we got to do. If you're going to walk across the floor and out the door, you got to put one foot in front of the other. And so if we're going to rebuild families and communities, we're going to need men to stop wimping out, making excuses, and saying, I can't do it. Because we can. And this is a place that we can do that. Manhood requires responsibility. And responsibility requires challenges. And a man who jerks and doesn't take on his responsibility and is not willing to take a challenge on is not much of a man. And that's why I say here with our church, we got some men. Because I feel like we're willing to take on challenge. We're willing to do these things. And sometimes we got to. And then we're getting close to the end. Verse number 28, we see that the priest made repairs. Each opposite their own house. Each opposite their own house. In other words, here's the first thing. For the sake of time, they didn't have to go very far to go to work on the wall. So it helped get the work done. Number two, this would ensure excellence. If a man is fixing the wall outside his home, then he's going to want it fixed well. Number three, this allowed whole families to get involved. So the, the, the priest there, not only was he there, he could get children and his wife, everybody out there helping build on the wall. And Nehemiah masterfully gave his skillfulness and the craftsman's personal investments into the work. He said, I want you to invest in this work because it's for you. See, I think one of the things Nehemiah did is he, he got these people finally to see ownership. Ownership. I own this. This, this is my community. Nehemiah wasn't even going to be living there. He was going back to the palace. But yet he was able to bring people together and to grab this. And then you see the last part in verse number 29 through 32. And one of the things you, you see a lot of down through there, almost every verse, it says, after them and beside him, next to him, and you see all these phrases suggesting there was solidarity and even quality control that was there being going on. And I must say that within the church, sometimes you may miss a ministry opportunity, but as soon as you see it, you, 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 you need to plug in to whatever it is that you can do. Plug in and, and, and invite somebody else to come along with you. Hey, let's go do this together. Let's go do this. 
Let's take care of this. Um, you, you see something out of place, put it in place. There, there's all kinds of places that we can help people. And we as believers, there's, there's all kinds of personalities. And you'll even meet some people who's got more than one. <laughs> but there, there's all kinds of skills that people have. And there's, there's all kinds of things that people can do. And sometimes it's finding what they can do and utilizing that to help in the ministry to help build what it is that God wants built. And God wants me, he wants you to use our spiritual gifts and for us to take those gifts and to accomplish something that has a great divine agenda. And, and sometimes it doesn't mean you got to know the end of the story. Sometimes you just end the story. Sometimes you just, you're here. This is what God wants you to do. Um, I, I think of our church and, you know, where we're at. I, I don't know where we're headed. I, I really don't, but God knows. Uh, I think of great days. Uh, I think of this, this thing with some of the singles that I, I've been involved in lately. I don't know where that's headed. And it's, and it's really something I've, have sort of tried to gear away from doing. And now it seems like I'm involved. <laughs> I'm caught. <laughs> but I don't know what God's got. I've always done this. Be open. Just be open. Whatever it is that God wants you to do, just, just be open to do it. Be involved. And, and, and you see something Get involved. You know, Don, uh, my friend, he, he's going to Italy on the 5th of September. Uh, he's going to be over there again for another three months. He's got some other folks supposed to be coming to help him and, and things. And Well, before he leaves, we've got a, a picnic with one of our groups, uh, Apex. And So I called the leader up at, for Apex. And I said, you know, listen, I you know, Don's going to be leaving on the 5th, and he's going to be there at the picnic. I, I think it would be great. I said, just a suggestion. If, if you let Don just sort of, just for a little bit, tell what he's doing, and then have him sit down and let the people come and pray over him. I said, one, it'll do them good to see somebody among us is serving the Lord. I said, number two, it'll do him a lot good to be prayed for and encourage him. I said, and I think it would please the Lord. He said, Kim, that's a great idea. He said, would you be the first one to pray for us at it? And I said, yeah, I will. And and I, I said, I just thought, he said, yeah, man, Kim, I hadn't thought of that. I think it would be a great idea. That way we get the spiritual emphasis in there. And sometimes you just got to, God brings it to your heart, just make a phone call. Tell somebody, you know, I think you would be great in doing this. I think you would be great to do this. And you never know what will come out of it. He was a young man in our church at Central Baptist Church. And uh, he and his family had come, started coming to our church. He got involved in the youth group. And I talked to him one day and I said, so Chad, what are you thinking about doing with your life? He said, well, I'm thinking about, he said, I'd like to be a marine biologist. I said, okay. I said, Chad, well, you've got such charisma. And, well, I really, there's something about you that's special. I really believe God could use you in the ministry somewhere. I said, I, I think that's something you ought to maybe pray about. Chad today preach at the second church now that he's pastoring. He pastored down in Alabama for many years. And he's now up in, I think, South Carolina pastoring a, a nice, a big church. 
and doing a great job. With just, I think, seven kids. And uh, when are you going to a missionary? Uh, 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 so, but he's doing a great job. Here was a guy who wanted to be a marine biologist. But one day I just said to him, you ever thought about being in the ministry? And I told our youth group during that time, I said, you know what? I think this is how you ought to look at life. I said, every one of you ought to say, I'm surrendering to full-time Christian ministry unless God calls me to do something else. And Chad told me he did that. And he's in full-time Christian ministry today. You never know what that one little word, that one little thing that you say to somebody and how it'll be taken and how God will use that. Different chapter. It was really a hard chapter looking at how do I preach this chapter? <laughs> and hopefully y'all got something out of it that'll help you and help us to move forward. Father, we thank you for everything you do in our lives. I pray you use us, you'll help us, that we might glorify your name in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen.